پاکستان جو ان کے نزدیک ان کی شناخت بھی ہے کہ حالات مسائل اور ان کے حل کے بارے میں ماجد نواز صاحب کا تجزیہ بہت خیال انگیز اور منفرد نوعیت کا ہے Yeah, of course, these are additional issues as well, which must be addressed. Electricity, poverty, um, the economic situation. And, and my point is really that on a national level, none of these problems can be solved if we don't have a strong central government that actually takes its responsibility to solve these problems. You can't have a strong central government if society is currently standing at a crossroads and is tearing Pakistan into different directions. One of the reasons we're in this situation is because we have democracy for two years, then we have military dictatorship for 10 years. And there's no consensus in this society as to the direction Pakistan should take. So part of this work isn't just to challenge the Islamist or extremist narrative, but it's also to then advocate uh, democratic principles, tolerance and pluralism as an alternative. And I believe that by encouraging civil society to, for the first time, popularize these ideas, I think uh, through a social movement, I think the government will become stronger because it's only a reflection, naturally, of, uh, of the society from where it comes. پاکستان میں اپنے حالیہ دورے کے دوران دیے جانے والے لیکچرز کے بارے میں انہوں نے ان خیالات کا اظہار کیا سم آف دا لیکچرز ہیڈ ٹو بی کینسل بیکاز آف پولیٹیکل انسٹیبلٹی ان سم آف دا سٹیز ان کراچی وی ہیڈ ون لیکچر کینسل بیکاز آف سم وائلنس دیٹ اکرڈ آن دا اسٹریٹس وچ واز ان کنیکٹڈ ٹو اس بٹ دین دا یونیورسٹیز ہیڈ ٹو کلوز وین آئی ونٹ ٹو بلوچستان ان کوئٹہ وی ہیڈ فور ایونٹس پلانڈ ون آف دوز ہیڈ ٹو بی کینسل بیکاز آف ٹو فیکشنز Um, of independence, pro-independence movements in Balochistan who had decided to argue with each other and then basically one of the factions uh, said that if the talk, if the lecture didn't go ahead on their terms that they would cancel it and they threatened to shoot anyone including the speaker, myself. Our experience in uh, Punjab was also uh, very good. Islamabad was phenomenal. We had a great response from Qaid Azam University where uh, I believe also we've recorded it. Um, and so, but I think overall it's been, it's been a very positive been a very positive response and we, we expect some resistance of course because we're being critical of a certain I ideology that people hold on to very dearly they believe it's Islam um, so we expect some resistance I think in the long term when people recognize that our point isn't to criticize Islam of course uh, Islam is a, a noble faith I'm very much a believer myself our point is to criticize the politicization of Islam the abuse of Islam for political purposes and when we make that distinction between Islam and Islamism once we popularize that distinction اسلام کے بارے میں ان کا اپنا ایک ذاتی نظریہ ہے جس سے اختلاف کیا جا سکتا ہے مگر ان کے خلوص کے بارے میں شاید دو آرا نہیں ہو سکتی Islam has solutions for all of life's affairs um, and uh, however we've got to pause here and say Islam has more than one solution for any problem because Ijtihad is open and it always has been open so any one problem you present to anyone who's a, a religious, religious theologian he'll give you an answer, you go to another one he'll give you a, a different answer, in some cases the opposite answer for the same problem so by saying Islam has solutions for life's affairs it doesn't mean it's always going to give you one solution for one problem uh, and, and that's a strength in Islam, it, it's not a weakness and it, people shouldn't think that's a weakness the fact that Islam can cater for difference for free thinking, for pluralistic ideas it's, it's a strength because it encourages debate and through debate ideas progress Islamists who have strayed from Islam when they call for their ideology What do I mean by that? Islamists call for synchronizing Sharia with state law. So what they believe is haram, they want to make illegal in state legislation. And I say that this is twisting Islam. It's against Islam. Because in Islam there is a handful of codes, maybe five or six, that we know as Masail al-Hudud, the, the penal laws, the Hudud laws. Yeah? Theft, murder, rape, there is a handful of them. And for these um, harams, there are criminal punishments. So for theft, the punishment is in the, in the Qur'an, as sariqa wa sariqatun faqta'u aydihima. The, the male uh, and female thief cut their hands. Now we can interpret that ayah in the modern context, and people have reinterpreted it for the modern context. The important thing to recognize from this passage for the purpose of this argument is that theft is not only haram, but it should also be criminally held illegal in a state. Yeah? But there are only five or six of such injunctions in Islam. 99% of the Sharia has absolutely no worldly punishment attached to it whatsoever. Whichever haram you think of, outside of the Masail al-Hudud, 99% of the Sharia comes with no punishment. So let's take women's dress. I challenge Islamists to show me anywhere in the Quran and Hadith where there's one punishment for a woman who chooses not to wear a headscarf in this world. We're not talking here about the Day of Judgment. It's a modern phenomenon. 
It didn't exist before the 1920s when groups began in Egypt. And it, it then spread in the 1940s here to Pakistan. And it spread in the 50s and 60s through Hizb al-Tahrir in the Arab world. And it started as a non-violent movement. And I accept that the majority of Islamists are not terrorists. But I intellectually, religiously and politically disagree with this ideology. And I think it's, it's against Islam to synchronize personal religious code with state law. To emphasize here, that does not mean that Islam doesn't provide answers to all of problems. The very answers Islam provides are what I've said, that it provides guidance for life's affairs away from criminal legislation, meaning it's a personal code of conduct. And what we're doing here is re-emphasizing traditional Islam that has always been away from law, away from state legislation, to say that it's a moral code for people. And we're separating morals from law, which is how Islam has always been. Because Sunni Islam has never had a clergy. And in fact, Islamists who are so anti-Western, the irony is that these ideas they've imported from the West. The Catholic Church had a clergy. They want to monopolize religious interpretation through political power and say that this is the only way to interpret Islam and will punish anyone through state law. It doesn't even have to be lashes, even a fine. will punish anyone through state law who disagrees with this religious interpretation. That's Catholicism. The Catholics have monopolized religious interpretation through the Vatican, through the Pope. Sunni Islam never had this. And we will resist any attempt to monopolize religious interpretation because the strength of Sunni Islam throughout its golden era has always been that it never had a clergy. Islam and Islamism ke fark ke baare mein, unki rai kuch is tarha hai. When I speak to, uh, to Parliament or to, to ministers in the UK, it's actually by making this differentiation that they understand that Islam is not at fault here, but there's a modern ideology. In fact, with, this is perfectly consistent with language. We're talking in English here, so let's give some examples. Communism, uh, the, the suffix at the end of the word ism is there to use to demonstrate that we're talking of a political ideology here, like capitalism, liberalism, socialism, communism, Islamism. The suffix ism is used to say we're talking of a political ideology. The prefix actually demonstrates the justificatory claim, i.e. how they justify their ideas. So communists believe in communitarianism. They believe that everyone has to work as a community. So that's where the commune comes from. Yeah? So with Islamists, they justify their political ideology by Islam. And that doesn't mean we acknowledge that there is a uh, that their justification is correct. In fact, our raison d'etre, the very reason we exist, is to say that in fact their justification is incorrect and Islam is different from the modern ideology of Islamism. اپنی گفتگو کے آخری حصے میں انہوں نے موجودہ نوجوان نسل خصوصاً برطانیہ میں رہنے والے نوجوانوں کے متعلق ایک نہایت خوبصورت تجزیہ پیش کیا۔ What I meant was by that in the western context what we want to do is reclaim Muslims who are born and raised now they're in their fourth generation they've been born and raised in the west and in many cases they don't have ties back to their countries of origin um, and what we want for them to do is be fully integrated in those societies in some cases they choose to express their religion by wearing a hijab or by eating halal meat and by expressing their religion in that way the point we're making is that mainstream British society should not see that as outside they should recognize that these are now British citizens and therefore their expression of religion now becomes a British phenomenon so they are now uh, wearing a hijab now becomes something which is part of British identity uh, the best way to demonstrate this is through uh, um, the national dish in the UK which many Pakistanis may not know but the national dish in the UK is chicken tikka masala yeah so that's that's like you know it's, it's, it's the, it always rates number one in any survey um, and they've appointed it as the national dish so it's now a British phenomenon and the point we're trying to make therefore is that Islam is not at conflict with British society our point is that even here in Pakistan state law should not interfere in people's personal religious choices